Okay, so finally we get to the household's maximization problem, finally, after all of this calculation. So, uh, now you can see that it's all in terms of consumption per unit of human capital. We've made our substitutions with a constant and this beta, um, and uh, now we have our budget constraint, which is in terms of consumption per unit of human capital and also wages per unit of human capital. Uh, and of course, I didn't include it, but in the background, there's also the no Ponzi scheme condition, which says we assume that people can't just basically have infinite consumption by borrowing against the future forever. Okay, so let's solve for household behavior. And um, I'm doing a little bit of a trick, a little bit of a shortcut. So um, this model is in continuous time. And when you're working at continuous time, formally you should be working with something called the Hamiltonian, which is uh, basically a version of the Lagrangian for continuous time. Um, I'm doing a bit of hand waving here uh, by using the standard uh, method of Lagrangian constants to optimize the one I hope you've seen in, in your intermediate micro course. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm going to do here. So how do we do that? Set up this function where here we have the uh, objective function that we want to optimize. And then we subtract off multiplied by a factor lambda the, uh, the budget constraint. Okay, so you can see here, this is the budget constraint. Here's the value of consumption. And then here's the value of lifetime income and that initial capital holdings. Okay. Um, the only thing that's important to mention about this is that this lambda here is constant. Okay. And um, this lambda, you'll recall from your intermediate micro course, you can also interpret it as a shadow price. It's the price of, I should say, the amounts more utility I would get if you slightly relaxed the constraint here. Um, sometimes uh, I would talk about the uh, Lagrangian function and what this thing is actually doing. Uh, so, you know, suppose that we have some, now I'm drawing a mountain, I suppose it's a mountain like this with uh, contour lines. Okay, so now you can see the peak up there in the top and these here are the contour lines. Um, you know, clearly the, the highest point on this mountain is up here. Um, what the Lagrangian does is it says, let's draw a line. Okay, and now we wanna find the highest point on the mountain uh, along this line. Okay, so that happens to be say this point here maybe okay and um and the shadow price is the slope of this mountain just at the point where the lagrangian function is maximized okay, that's supposed to be an arrow didn't do a very good one yet the slope of this mountain right where we're maximizing the lagrangian so it's like if you were to sort of allow me to move this budget constraint just a little bit in this direction you know i'm just going to shift this guy a little tiny bit in this direction how much farther up the mountain would I get? That's lambda. Okay, that's how you interpret lambda. It's like the shadow price. Okay, so if we uh, take first order conditions, bit of hand waving here, um, with respect to CT, so we're going to take the derivative of L. Maybe I should say that here: derivative of L with respect to CT. Okay, we're going to get something like this, right? So we have a B, and then here, we just get the inside part of the integral, okay? Um, and then, uh, because, you know, formally, again, this is a little bit hand wavy, there's only one exact, I'm talking about a particular CT, one particular moment, right? So this integral, you can interpret it as a sum, a sum of all kinds of different moments, all kinds of different Ts. Now we're asking about a particular T, Okay, so it's just one of the elements of this sum. And uh, let's take the derivative. So it's gonna be, you can see that we're gonna take, well, let's just do it. So the derivative is gonna be one minus theta, ct one, oops. 
to the negative theta, and then we're dividing by one minus theta. Of course, we're gonna cross those guys out. We still have the, this term is still here, this term is still here, put those out front. Okay, and that's how we get this part there. On the other side, this term doesn't have a CT in it, so we can forget about it. Then here we have a lambda. Again, this is just one of these one of these moments. So we're, we're gonna forget about the integral, that's like a sum. We're only gonna look at that one particular CT, that one particular moment. And you can see it's just linear. So when we take the derivative with respect to CT, that thing's gonna go away. And we end up with this, uh, just this e to the power negative r, and then e to the n plus g r. Here I wrote g plus n times t. Okay, and that's it. So why is this a bit hand wavy? Well, there's a little bit of an additional complication that comes in because of the dt. Formally, there should be a dt on both sides, and uh, there's some trickiness that's involved there, but let's abstract from that. This will give us the uh, a sensible answer. Okay, so now you can see uh, I've got an expression there. This is just copying what I had from the last slide. Let's take logs on both sides. We're going to take a log of the left-hand side and a log of the right-hand side. Since log turns, uh, log has two properties that are important here. So you guys know these properties. The log of x times y is equal to the log of x plus the log of y. That's one important property here. Second one is if we have the log of x to the power y, that's equal to y times log of x. I'm gonna use both of those properties here. So we have log of b. Here we have log uh, a plus log of e to the power negative beta t. Of course, you know, one more property of log. Log of e to the power x is equal to x. That's basically the definition of log. Um, so here we have log of e to the power negative bt. Well, beta t is the log and the e to the e are going to cancel out. So we're just going to get beta t. And then here we're going to use this power rule. So the negative theta we're going to take down in front and we just get log of ct. Do something similar on the right hand side you see we have two of these exponential functions the log is going to cancel them out so we're going to get log of lambda minus rt plus n plus g times t okay now we we've, we've solved this for a particular t but actually this is going to be true for we could have chosen any t you know t1 t2 t prime any sort of value for t this equation is going to hold so um So yeah, that's something to point out. Oh, I'm pointing that out. I'm moving a bit ahead of myself. All right, let's do one more thing. Let's write out the definition of RT. It's just the, the integral from zero to T of little r tau d tau. If you flip back a few slides, you'll see this definition. Okay, then finally, this now, this, now what I just said, this expression holds for any value of T, which means that we can take the derivative on both sides um, of the expression. Okay, so this isn't one particular t, it actually holds for any value of t that we choose. So let's take the derivative um, on both sides and then that, because of that property, um, the equality is maintained if we take the derivative on both sides. So take the derivative, you see there's a beta here, that's gonna um, remain. And then here, you know, the derivative of log ct with respect to t is equal to one divided by ct times dct dt. Okay, this is what we actually call c dot t. So the derivative of any variable with respect to time, we can write that as uh, that variable with a dot on top, okay, divided by ct. So that's what I've written here. And then n plus g, that's simple enough. You guys know how to take a derivative of a function that looks like that. This one, I don't know if you know this, but if you have, a, if you have an integral where you're taking the derivative with respect to one of the limits of the integral, then actually the derivative is you just plug in the value. 
uh, into the integrand. So you can see here that I've just plugged in the t into the r function. And this might, it's actually quite reasonable if you think about it. So what we're doing when we take the derivative here is we're saying, how much does the value of this expression change if I was to make t just a little tiny bit bigger? Well, again, an integral is like a sum of the term from zero to t. So if I make was to make t just a little bit bigger, then what am I gonna add? Well, I'm gonna add the value of the integrand, this r function here, at t. That's how much I add if I, if I increase t a little tiny bit, okay? So that's how I get this. And then this is the expression we're gonna work with. So you can see I'm gonna copy this onto the next slide, but all we're gonna do is isolate this thing here which we can think of as the growth rate of, of little c. Okay, so this is copied from the last slide. And then here, this is like the growth rate of consumption. Here's the amount that consumption changes divided by the level of consumption. That's a growth rate. Um, and then it's equal to this expression. Okay. We're gonna do a couple more substitutions. So recall that we have a definition of beta here. Beta was the discount rate minus the population growth rate minus this expression involving the growth rate of education or productivity. And you can get, you know, you plug this in here for beta, you can see that you're gonna be able to cancel out, for instance, the growth rate of the population, and you'll end up with this expression here. Let me do the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna do one very last thing here. So this is the growth rate of consumption per unit of human capital. What if we wanted to look at the growth rate of consumption per person? Okay, so per worker rather than per unit of human capital. Okay. Okay, so let's think about uh, what we have here. So little ct, recall little ct is equal to big ct divided by at. Okay, so consumption per unit of human capital is equal to consumption per worker divided by the education level. Okay. So now let's think about how to write dc dot little c dot t is equal to the derivative of, oops, derivative of little c with respect to time. Okay. So how do we put that in terms of big c t? Well, that's the derivative of big c t divided by a t with respect to time. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to write out what this is, but uh, if you do a little bit of work, you'll see this. So um, it's going to be big C now. Make that look more big. Big C dot T divided by AT minus A dot T divided by AT times CT. Since we have a dot t divided by at here, oh, I should be careful, I think this is at squared. Um, since we've got an a dot t divided by at, that's actually the growth rate, and we've made an assumption about that already. So I'm just going to re rewrite this one more time. c dot t divided by at minus g times big ct, and then here, uh, times one divided by at. Okay, so this is the derivative of little ct with respect to t. It's equal to this complicated expression. Now let's divide, now let's think about this, c dot t divided by ct. So let's divide this by little ct. And we'll divide this over here also by little ct. Recall that little ct is big ct divided by at. So we can, now we're gonna get big c dot t divided by ct. Um, the at here is gonna cancel out. 
And then here we've got a CT divided by AT. So actually that whole thing cancels out. We just get minus G. Okay. So what have we concluded? We've concluded that little c dot t divided by little ct is equal to big c dot t divided by big ct minus g. Okay, and you know that was a lot of calculation again, but again it makes somewhat intuitive sense because um, this thing here is going to grow faster than this thing here. You know the consumption per worker is going to be growing faster because the level of human capital is growing over time, right? So consumption per unit of human capital is growing slower than consumption per worker, since the workers themselves are getting more productive. Okay, so how much slower? It turns out that the, it's slower by the growth rate of human capital, which is somewhat intuitive. Okay, so you know, another way to write this would be big C dot T divided by big CT is equal to G plus little c dot t divided by ct. And you can see that that's exactly what we've written here, right? Here's g, here's little c dot t divided by little ct. Um, if you just do a little algebra with this expression, you can see that it's gonna simplify. In particular, you can see we're adding a g here and we're subtracting a, a g here. So that means we're gonna end up with this nice expression. And this expression here is very easily interpretable. Okay, so what this says is, how fast does consumption grow? Well, it depends on two things. One is the interest rate relative to the discount rate. Okay, so if the interest rate is higher, then we expect that consumption will grow faster. Okay. If the discount rate is higher, oh, I should be a little bit careful here. Suppose that the interest rate is, is bigger than the discount rate. If that's true, then consumption will grow. I, actually, I, I think what I just said is fine. When the interest rate is higher, that consumption grows faster, all else equal. Okay. If the discount rate is, fi is higher, then consumption grows slower, all else equal, which makes sense, right? If I don't care as much about myself in the future, consumption is going to grow slower. If I get a higher return on my investments, then consumption is going to grow faster. So intuitively that makes sense. It's mediated by this term here, which if you'll recall, this is the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. So what this says here is that if there's some difference here, suppose now that the interest rate is higher than the discount rate. Okay, so this is positive in here. If my, inter, uh, in, if my the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is higher then I'm happy to move my consumption to wherever I can get more consumption. You know, I don't care if it's today or tomorrow, I just want the total amount to be more. So then if I can get a higher return on my investments than my discount rate, great, let's move that consumption to tomorrow. I'll invest everything. I'll consume very little today. On the other hand, suppose that one divided by theta is very low, saying that I really care about consuming the same amount every period and I don't care what the prices are, then that says, I don't really care what's happening with these two terms. It could be big, it could be small. My one over theta is very tiny, which means that I'm not gonna change my consumption very much.